Why deploy infantry on a planet when you could simply park your fleet in its orbit and bombard your enemy cities? When the Myrians declared war on the Terrans, everyone thought they were finished. All the Terrans had going for them was advanced shielding technology. Their guns couldn't pierce the Myrian shields or armor. Their missiles were slow and easily avoided. Only high-caliber Terran weapons could pierce Myrian battlesuits. The Myrians knew this, of course. They also knew that any and all shields required power. So when the Myrian fleet entered the Sol system, they began eliminating power sources, fusion reactors, antimatter reactors, even fission and solar power generators. But it wasn't enough. The third planet in the Sol system, Earth, was the Terran homeworld, and they didn't use fusion power or antimatter power for their shields there. They were there, of course, for redundancy, but mostly powered Terran cities. No, the Terrans used something called geothermal power for their shields. All they had to do was to place a few million heavily shielded power generators inside the mantle under the ocean and just cycle the heated ocean water through some fans for power. Then send the extreme amount of generated power to incredibly powerful shield generators and suddenly Earth becomes a fortress. This was possible because of the type of world that the Terrans inhabited. The surface of the planet wasn't uniform and was divided into several different pieces. These pieces moved around and against each other, generating pressures released in events called earthquakes or volcanic eruptions. The core of the planet generated huge amounts of heat and pressure. This geothermal power continually sustained heavy orbital shielding over almost all of the Terran homeworld. Even the oceans, vast swaths of water were completely covered as some of these plate boundaries ran through them. There was a single hole in the shield, however. Well, it wasn't a hole, really. It was still able to prevent orbital strikes and planet crackers from reaching the surface, but it was thin enough to get some drop pods through. The Murians didn't stop to think about whether it was intentional. Of course, the Terrans didn't just sit idle while the Murian fleet sat in orbit. Sometimes the planetary shield would flare releasing powerful electromagnetic pulses that scrambled targeting systems. A few Terran ships were always whittling away at the Myrian fleet, though they did little damage. The Myrian commander gave the order to retreat, not because they were beaten, but because they did not have the technology to win. Thirty years later, the Myrians came back with a larger fleet, carrying millions of soldiers and hundreds of thousands of drop pods. They blockaded the system and destroyed the orbital defense platforms orbiting the moons and planets. They couldn't get at the space elevators, which were covered under the planetary shields. During the 30 years, the Terrans had built larger and thicker shields over all other rocky planets and moons in their system. The Earth shield alone was nearly five times as strong as it had been when the Myrians had left the Sol system. The Myrians began deploying the drop pods over the observed hole in the Terran shielding. They landed in the northern part of one of the continents, a region named Canada. And while they braved the thick snow and frigid cold, their fleet in orbit was attacked. It wasn't hit by the Terrans, really. But when you make the best shielding technology in the galaxy, that gets you allies very quickly. So the Terran-aligned factions pinned the Myrians against the planetary shield of Earth. It wasn't an extremely savage battle, as the Myrians just moved their fleet away from the Allied fleets. The Allied fleets let them do so. The shield curved downward towards the planet as the Myrians got closer. Under the fire of Terran allies and pinned between a rock and a hard place, they chose the rock. They landed their light fighters in the Terran atmosphere, unable to properly target cities due to electromagnetic interference. The battle cruisers and dreadnoughts of the Myrians remained in high orbit. Nothing could touch them under the cover of their combined shielding. Or so they thought. As it turns out, extremely efficient geothermal power could be weaponized. The Terrans knew how to increase volcanic pressures with a few underground fusion bombs. Other planets had volcanoes as well. It was common on planets and moons exposed to heavy tidal gravity. But the Myrians did not have any proper models for a super volcano. The Terrans did. The Myrians detected a massive explosion on the surface of the planet. An impossibly large volcanic caldera, thought dormant by the Myrians in their initial scan of Earth's surface, had erupted. 
The shockwave circled the planet dozens of times. But the Myrians had larger problems. The power of the eruption had destroyed most of their infantry forces and nearly all of their cruiser escorts. The ash made the power draw of their shielding increase by nearly 20 times. The Myrians surrendered from the helm of their finest dreadnought, now barely able to keep the lights on. The Terrans accepted their surrender promptly. Ten days later, they sent another message to the wider galaxy. We don't just fight on our planets, we fight using our planets. If you finish this story, please subscribe and like the video. Then leave a comment that says, I like the story, and I will heart every single one of them. It really helps me. Thank you for your time.